Greetings to the brethren. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus, where we are gathered here today on the internet to address his word, and I'm very happy to give the first sermon from my new apartment. Recently, the Lord Jesus delivered me unto a new apartment, and it's really wonderful. You guys can see I even have my own air conditioner. It's going to be really cool when it gets hot here in the summer, so praise the Lord, for he is my shepherd and I shall not want. So, the subject of this sermon, I have to say, is very serious. Uh, so you guys know that I have my Inner Sanctum group, and I always put my phone number on the videos. And oh, by the way, if anyone wants to contact me, join uh, our WhatsApp group, email me, donate to the ministry, anything like that, I'll put all of my contact information in the description of this video. So I mention this because I'll oftentimes get messages from the brethren just telling me about different, you know, situations in their lives, asking me to pray for them or asking me what my thoughts are on the situation. And what I do is I just listen to what they say. And then I pray to the Lord Jesus to give me some words, to show me some scriptures. And then after sufficient time, I get back to them and I say, here, here's my perspective on it, you know. And recently, uh, I've been contacted by multiple brethren, all who had a similar issue, a similar problem. And it had to, has to do with divorce. And I heard this from a number of brethren. Basically, it went something like this. They said, you know, I'm really not satisfied with my current spouse. Uh, you know, they're a believer, but they're not that close to the Lord. And they're kind of being a jerk. Maybe they're not having intimacy with me. Maybe they're not paying enough attention to me. Maybe they have some problem and I'm really not feeling fulfilled. And so I'm thinking of getting a divorce, or even in some cases, I had people tell me I'm thinking of even committing adultery uh, because my current spouse just isn't getting the job done. And so as I was contacted by different brethren, all with this same issue, I thought, man, it almost seems like the Lord's trying to draw my attention to this issue. So I began to search through the scriptures to try to get a clearer picture of what the Lord wants us to do in these type of situations. And what I found was that the Lord came through loud and clear to me. I mean, it was amazing. Like he always responds to me in one way or another. But in these cases, when I heard from some of the brethren and I said, oh, Lord, show me, you know, what you think about this, man, he was really clear with me. <laughs> he was just unfailingly clear. He, he always is in different ways. But in this case, it was like I clicked the pen and right away the Holy Spirit was like, write this down, <laughs> go to this scripture, go to this scripture. What I discovered is that the Lord takes divorce very seriously. Wow. You know, something about God is he doesn't see the world as we do. We have our own views, you know, and if you were to try to guess with your own in human intuition, you know, what's like one of the worst things a Christian could do, you might think, I don't know, maybe get drunk and just beat your brother to a pulp who's also a Christian because of a football game dispute or something, right? You might think of something like that. You know, and that, that's definitely a terrible sin. But what I found is that like, man, when it comes to divorce, wow, the Lord has a strong view on divorce and he does not like divorce. I'm telling you, he was very clear of, with me about this. You know, within the spiritual world, you got spiritual misdemeanors, so to speak. Things that, you know, they're not good, like, like me smoking, for example. It's not good. I know I shouldn't do it. I'm I'm working on it, but you know, it's more of a spiritual misdemeanor. At least that's the impression I get from the Lord. It's not good, you know, but it's like, it's not really the end of the world. Like just have faith, you know, but there's other things that like are more like spiritual felonies. And what I found was divorce is like a spiritual felony in the eyes of the Lord. So before I go on anymore, I want to start by reading some scriptures because what I want to get through to you is if you're married and you're thinking of getting a divorce, oh man, you should seriously think again. But before I babble on more, let me read to you some scriptures. Let's start in 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, 
except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So what's basically saying here is that like, you know, the modern world, and you can see so clearly how the word of God contrasts with the word of man in society. Because society says, like, when it comes to sex, like, oh, you should only do it if you just really feel like it. You know, like, and if you don't feel like it, you don't have to do it. But what the word of God is saying here is that when you're married and your partner wants intimacy, like, you don't have power over your own body. You need to give it to them because that's part of the bondage, the commandment of marriage. A good analogy would be like, Let's say you're a man and you're like, man, I'm working a lot. I'm putting in all these shifts just to feed my kids and provide for my wife. You know what? Today, I don't feel like doing it. I think I'll just let him go hungry for a week and I'll just stay home, play video games. It's like, guess what? You're a father. You don't get to do that. I know you're tired. I know you don't want to go to work, you know, but you need to because that's the bondage you're under. You can't just be like, I don't feel like feeding my kids. It's like, not, it's not an option. <laughs> You know, and what we're seeing here is that similarly with intimacy, both for husbands and their wives and wives to the husband, like your partner has the authority over your body. So like if your partner wants intimacy, you need to give it to them because that's why you married them. You entered into this bondage, into this contract. And if you don't give it to them, you're actually letting, making way for Satan to possibly tempt your partner. Uh, and now that's what verse five is. Defraud ye not one the other. It's like, if you look at the NASB translation, it's like, stop denying your spouse, except it be with consent that you both agree to for a time, for a limited time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Do that for a time and then come together again, as in resume your intimacy. So Satan does not tempt you, right? Okay. So, um, let's keep reading. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself. This is Paul saying he's like celibate, basically. He's like not married. And he said, that's a good thing. If you have that gift, like if you just don't desire to have a husband or wife, that's fine. That That's a gift and that's that's a good thing. But, you know, most people don't have that gift and that's also fine. That's why God's going to give you a spouse, right? For I would that all men were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, meaning if they have these sexual desires, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. And notice that if you look at the NS NASB, it says better to marry than to burn with passion or burn with desire. It's not talking about burning in hell. We know that we get out of hell by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This is saying that if you are if you don't have the gift of like not wanting sex, then like get married. <laughs> That's what it's there for. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. But to the rest I speak, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath, hath a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. So notice that God refers to marriage as bondage, right? It's like something you're locked into. Like, our culture makes marriage seem like this thing you're just going to get. It's all about what you're going to get. You're just going to get all this stuff. But marriage in a lot of ways is more like having a job. It, it's not just like, hey, we're going to pay you 100K a year. Oh, and if you feel like doing some work, you can. It's like, no, no, contract's been made. We're going to pay you 100K a year, but you're going to show up at 6 a.m., work 10 hours a day. And if you stop doing that, you're not getting that 100K. It's like, it's not like optional. So I know if you feel like working, you can. But if not, if money's just going to your bank account. It's like, no. See, it doesn't work like that. A job is like a contract. Well, marriage is like a contract a thousand times more sacred and important than like your job. And 
Okay, so uh, so what we're seeing here is that if you are married to an unbeliever, like you can't just depart from them. If they're happy being with you, you got to stay with them. However, if they depart from you, if they divorce you, then the scripture says, let them go. For God has called us to peace, right? God has called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And so ordain I in all churches. Okay, so I want to highlight something here within these verses. Again, this is 1 Corinthians 7. Verses 10 and 11 are very key. Let me read them again. Verse 10. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So basically, you have two options for men or women who divorce their spouses. You can stay single, or you can be reconciled with your ex. But notice that the Lord does not say, oh, you can divorce and just trade it in for a better model, because that's kind of what our culture thinks. Like, oh, marriage, it's all about what you're going to get. It's all about you getting pleased by all this stuff you're going to get. Oh, you're not getting it. Your your partner put on a few pounds. Oh, your partner's being a jerk. Oh, we'll just trade him in and you'll get a new model. And I feel like in particular, Satan lies to women about this with the whole culture and makes it seem like to women like, oh, you can always just chuck away your husband and just, and you'll get a better one. You got Tinder, you got all these thirsty men out there. Oh, you can always just get in a new model. And what I'm here to tell you is that those of you seeing this who are believers, we are under the ordinances of God and Nothing can happen without God's will, no matter how available it seems. Like if God wanted me to starve to death, it doesn't matter that I have money in the bank. It doesn't matter if every restaurant in the city gave me free food. If he wanted me to starve, something would just block it and I would starve to death. Like God has that kind of power and he exercises that kind of power in the lives of believers. And so realize that like it's not your own will or your own beauty or anything that allows you to get a partner. It's God giving you one. And what we're going to see here through the scriptures is that God is exceedingly clear that to him, marriage is so sacred. It's so, it's like two soldiers going out on a battlefield who swear an oath that if one of them gets shot up, the other one's going to carry him over their shoulder. In the middle of the battle, you can't just be like, ah, you know what? I think I'm just going to leave that guy. It's like, no, hey, you care, not leave no man behind. And what we're going to see is that like the very fact that, to describe the relationship between us and the believers and God, what what metaphor does God use? Marriage. <laughs> Who are we? The bride of Christ. So marriage is a very serious thing in the eyes of the Lord. That's what he was showing me. He takes marriage very seriously. Marriage for him is, is at the very core of humanity. And one thing that the Lord hates is divorce. But let's read some further verses. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. That if you're a woman or a man, first of all, don't divorce your partner, except in the case that they unrepentantly are committing adultery, like that they just keep doing it in your face. They don't feel any sadness about it. It's not like they did it and then they feel ashamed and they say, please forgive me. Now, this is like unrepentant. This is they're just like, nope, I'm taking a new partner every day. Okay. In that case, you're allowed to divorce. But basically, the only other cases are one. If your if your husband if your husband or your wife are an unbeliever and they leave you, you can't just leave them. If they leave you, you can let them go. In fact, you are commanded to let them go. Okay, um, but what we're going to see is that if you do, God forbid, get divorced for some reason, God then gives you two options: stay single for the rest of your life, or option B, get reconciled with the person that you divorced. So, verse twenty-seven of First Corinthians repeats this command in verse eleven. If we read verse 27, we will read this. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. So like, if you're married, don't try to get divorced. Are you divorced? Like, don't, or are you not bound? Are you not married? Like, don't seek out a wife. Art thou loosed from a wife? Meaning, were you married, but you got divorced? Then don't seek out a new wife. Options are very clear. You can remain single or you can get reconciled with your ex. Okay, 
There is another exception in verse 39, which I call the death exception, which reads as following. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. So if you're married and your partner dies, then you can go search out a new mate. But even then, the one that the Lord selects, not just anyone, the Lord's going to guide you to the right person. So you have a death exemption from verse 27 and verse 11, which say, don't get divorced. And if you are divorced, you got two options. Stay single the rest of your life or get reconciled with your ex. Okay, so now I would like to, to emphasize how clear this is throughout the scripture. Because, you know, how many times does God have to tell us something in the scripture for us to know that it's his will? Once. What if he tells it to us like 12 times? Then <laughs> he's really making it clear that, that there's no ambiguity in this situation at all. So now I'm going to read from Matthew 19. Okay. So this is where the Pharisees come to Jesus. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And if you look up translations of this other than KJV, you'll see that it really means any cause. So the Pharisees are saying to Jesus, Oh, is a, is a man allowed to divorce his wife for any reason? Right? They're sort of tempting him, right? Because they're going back to the law of Moses, right? But Jesus answered, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Twain means two. They two shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And asunder means apart. So the two that God has made one, let not man divide that. Now the Pharisees hit back. They say, they said unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Put her away means divorce her. This is Jesus. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. So also, if you married a divorced woman, you're also committing adultery. Now, because the Pharisees were kind of tempting Jesus to go against Moses, but Jesus doesn't even go back to, to Moses. He goes back before. He goes back to Adam and Eve. He goes back to Genesis and says, God never had divorce as part of his plan. That was never part of it. Later, we're going to look at, at Malachi and see a little bit more about what's going on here. But what we should be seeing is that God hates divorce. He does not like it. It is not part of his plan. The only time he allows it is in the very horrific case of when you have a spouse who, not that they make a mistake, they commit adultery, ah, oh, they're sorry, but if they know it was wrong, that's one thing. That's what we call sin that's repented of. Some cases you have utterly unrepentant sin, where your believing husband or wife just is just like fornicating in your face, doesn't even admit it's wrong, says, so I'm going to keep doing it. In that case, God will allow divorce as a sort of form of mercy to the person who's being adulterated against repeatedly. But what we see is that God, even then God hates divorce. He does not like divorce. It is never, ever part of his plan. Um, so let's read Luke 16, 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Matthew 5, 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Mark 10, 12. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Okay. So. Now I want to get to Malachi 2.16 which is where God clearly expresses that he hates divorce. It is not part of his plan. He, he loathes divorce. Because you know what divorce is? 
It's the destruction of a family. It's like the suicide of a whole family. If I were to just blow my brains out, I mean, God would hate that, of course. It'd be a terrible decision. That'd be like the destruction of my life and all the good that I could have possibly done. Well, when you get divorced, you're literally tearing a family apart because marriage is like the sacred covenant that binds a man and a woman together for life, that produces a stable platform for children, that allows the man to leave his parents and start his own family. And so divorce is literally the willful destruction of a family. And God takes family very seriously. It's the bedrock of all society. It's how he describes the church itself. Again, with the analogy, he could have used any analogy. He says, you're like a family. What are we in Christ? We're the brethren, right? What have we been, uh, what's happened to us? We've been adopted into a family. So God takes family very seriously. And marriage is a covenant really before God to God where you're swearing to God, I will be with this person through sickness and health, no matter what happens. If they get away from the Lord, if they if they commit a certain mistake, I will forgive them. If they're repentant, uh, we'll get more to that in a second. Malachi 2.16 For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith, He hateth putting away. Putting away means divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. So God considers divorce to be treachery against your spouse. Makes perfect sense because you entered into this covenant with God and with them to stay with them till death do you part. And if you just put them away and divorce them for any reason other than that they're just violating the covenant by unrepentantly fornicating, they got no remorse, they're doing it multiple times. Okay, in that case, God will allow divorce as a sort of form of mercy. But what we see here is that he hates divorce. He hates to see that destruction of a family. And if we read back Malachi a little bit, we see the context for this. And I have to say, as I read this, it just echoed through my spirit that I had heard various brethren uh, in, in Christ talking to me about their situation. Some of them who were contemplating divorce and others who already had gotten divorced and couldn't figure out why they couldn't find a new partner. And so as I read this Malachi 2.16, where the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away divorce. When God hates something... That's serious, man. So let's read just a little bit of the context of that. Let's go back to verse 10 in Malachi 2, where it says, Judah profaned the covenant. Again, realize a covenant is like a sacred contract. We see God making it with, with uh, Jewish people and so on. But check this out. So verse 10, have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? by profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. Here we're, we're seeing the Lord use very strong words, things he hates, abomination, treachery. Man, the Lord's getting fierce with his language here. Praise the Lord. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Yet ye say, Wherefore? So what's happening here is these people have done something and they're coming to the altar of the Lord and they're weeping and they're saying, Lord, why aren't you answering our prayers? Lord, we're offering you all this good stuff. Lord, why have you gone silent on us? Why have you abandoned us? And here the Lord explains why, You're right? Because these people are saying, why? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Yet means still. It's like she's still your companion. She's still the one you made the covenant with. But what did these people do? They put away the wives of their youth. They went after, they decided to upgrade. They wanted a new model. So they went after some attractive foreign women who worshiped other gods. And the Lord's saying, I hate that. He's saying, you have dealt treacherously with your companion. The wife of your youth, she was still the one you're in the covenant with, Right? She's still thy companion, the wife of thy covenant. 
and did not he make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously. So the Lord is really serious about divorce. He hates it. He considers it treachery. And when these people come to him weeping and offering all this stuff, and he's just ignoring him, the Lord's like, you want to know why? Because you treacherized against the wife of your youth. And I hate that. <laughs> so the Lord's very clear about that. Okay, so let's just read a few a few more verses, and then I'm going to talk about what we should do instead of getting divorced. Okay, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so I think I hit the main scriptures. There's more I could have picked out, but there you have like seven separate scriptures where the Lord makes it clear that he does not like divorce, that divorce for him is like a spiritual felony. Okay, so um, I just, I, comp I, I literally made it separate sermons to like give to different people who asked me questions, but since they all kind of overlapped and had to do with divorce, adultery, contemplating adultery, why can't they find a new partner? I sort of tried to merge it all into one sermon to give all the brethren because I felt like the Lord was just putting it on my heart. Evan, speak strongly on this. Evan, speak strongly on this. Let there be no ambiguity here. My word is not ambiguous. When people come to me crying and saying, oh, how come I can't find a new partner? Like, because if you divorce your existing partner, saving for the case of them just unrepentantly fornicating, notice he doesn't give any other <laughs> exceptions. Well, if they die, right? But it's not like, oh, they don't satisfy me anymore. Oh, they're being a jerk. Oh, they won't be intimately. All these things are sins. What we're going to see is that there's another option other than divorce, which is for the Lord to restore your marriage with his holy power, which he can do, which he wants to do, but he will not do without your consent. Okay. So, um, I want to read now Matthew seven twelve. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Okay, so, like I said, I heard from a bunch of different brethren, all within the space of a week or two, who were in various stages of either considering getting a divorce having already committed adultery and thinking about marrying the adulterer, considering committing adultery but hadn't done it yet, or already had had a divorce and had then spent years of singleness, can't figure out why they can't find a new partner, they're weeping over it. And I feel that this is all contained in this central question, which is what do you do when you're in a marriage? Um, and I believe every case basically involved uh, two believers being together. And pretty much every case I heard from one of one of the two, they're like, oh, the other one, they're not that close to the Lord. They won't be intimate with me that much. They put me down. They do things that our current culture would say are abusive, which to be honest, I don't even know what that word means these days because it's tossed about so much in modern lingo. Like pretty much abuse is anything short of someone giving you everything you want all the time. Like you, I see online articles like, I'm being abused because my husband keeps watching sports games when he gets home from work. And it's like, what does that word even mean? You know, like... Like you would think it meant like my husband beats me up every day or something, but no, I'm hearing all this stuff like, oh, it's abuse. So, you know, if, if your wife doesn't have enough sex with you or this or that, and it's like, yes, those things are sins. They're not good. The Lord doesn't like them. But like, I just wonder what does the word abuse even mean these days? Notice there's no abuse exception. The only thing the Lord considers abuse enough for divorce is if your spouse is unrepentantly fornicating, not that they did it and then they're sorry about it. And they say, please don't leave me. That's, that's called repenting for a sin. And what do you think God does to them when they do that before God? I'll tell you, he forgives them because he forgives. When you make a mistake and we all do in different ways and we come before the Lord and ask his forgiveness, he is faithful and, and just to forgive us of our sins. So, so continuing on here. Um, so I heard from various believers 
male and female alike who were saying that like they they weren't getting what they wanted from their spouses and they described me various situations and in each case I could sympathize I'm like oh man that, that sounds terrible I wouldn't want to be in that position either it, it sounds like your marriage is kind of broken it sounds like it's very unfulfilling and some of the believers were saying, you know, I think I may have to commit adultery or get a divorce and basically saying, I may, I may need to get a new, a new spouse. And so this is what I wanted to say is that the things that you want to get from the adulterer or the new spouse or whoever is not currently your spouse, the things that you want, companionship, friendship, love, fulfillment, validation, intimacy, sexual needs met, kindness, etc., those are godly desires. It's good for you to want those things. You should want those things. That, that, is, that is good, right? It is good to want these things and it's good to get them. But seeking them from any man or woman other than your husband or wife is not going to work. Satan will lie to you and say, oh, you just need a different wife or a husband. You just need to commit adultery. You just need to divorce him and find a new believing partner. I'm telling you, from the experience of talking to a lot of people, and seeing their lives, some of them who went along this path, it, it's not going to work because God doesn't allow it. It's not his plan. This whole no-fault divorce thing is not of God. God does not like it. He hates divorce. And what he wants to see is for your marriage to be fixed. And he can and will help you with it. But the first thing you have to do is decide not to go down the path of adultery or divorce. And notice that adultery isn't just if you sleep with someone while you're still married. If you divorce them and then go get married to someone else, God considers that adultery. If that person, the new person you seek out and marry, even if they're a virgin, they're now committing adultery by having married you. So see how God says that? Like if you put away your wife or your husband, you're causing them to commit adultery when they're with anyone else. If you marry some new person, you're causing them to commit adultery because they've married someone who who has put away their, their husband or wife. So God sees it all as adultery. Like when you're married, you can have sex with one person, your husband or your wife. The only time that gets released is if they die. Okay, now you can seek out someone new, someone that the Lord approves of, you know, a fellow believer. Um, also, I saw that really clear. The Lord does not want us to marry unbelievers. There might be some rare special exemptions, but clearly the Lord wants us to be married to believers. And of course, the other exception is if you are married to an unbeliever for some reason, like maybe before you got saved, you're married to an unbeliever and they leave you, then you are to let them go, right? Um, so, but what I was saying is all these things that you want that you're not currently getting from your spouse, that's, that's good to want those things. And it's good to get those things. But the first thing you got to get out of your head is you're not going to get them by switching to someone else. I'm telling you, it's not going to happen. Like I spoke to multiple believers who got divorced from their partners because they weren't getting fulfilled. And what ended up happening was they ended up either getting a new partner that then the relationship was even worse and they got cheated on and it was even more terrible, or they just stayed single and for the life of them couldn't be anyone. And it's like, yeah, that's the divine earthly judgment that we're all under as believers. Now you're going to get into heaven no matter what, if you believe in Jesus, doesn't matter. You can be the world's worst adulterer. You will get into heaven, but until you die, you're still subject to God's judgment on earth. And that starts in the house of believers. So as believers, we are strictly held under this judgment. Now, if you got divorced before you were reborn, that's a whole different story. That's forgiven. You're washed. You're regenerated. Like I led souls into hell with Hinduism. I fornicated. I did all kinds of sins. I was reborn and God made it clear to me those sins are forgiven. He's not holding those against me because I didn't know. I was in unbelief. Once you're a believer... You're a new man in Christ. But if as a believer, you now get divorced, or if I was to do the same stuff I did before now, oh man, the hammer of God would come down upon me, God forbid. You're not going to be see me telling anyone to go to any Hindu gods now. But I was literally doing that a week before I was reborn. So if you got divorced before you were uh, reborn, don't worry about it. That's on. That's nailed to the cross. That's your old man. You got a fresh start. This is all about after you've been saved. Okay, so... It's if your plan is to switch to a different partner to get your needs met, it's not going to work. Okay, it's not going to work. Quite the contrary, it's only going to bring further divine judgment and punishment upon you. So, if you want to get these things, i.e., all the fulfillment you want emotionally, sexually, friendship from your spouse that you're not currently getting, okay, this is what you need to do. The what you need to do is the following. So, in the case that you have committed adultery, okay, this is what you need to do. You need to repent which is to fully see and accept with your whole heart and mind that it was a mistake to seek these things from someone other than your husband or your wife, right? 
just repent, just say, you know, because I heard a lot from believers saying, yeah, I committed adultery, but like I had to because my husband or wife was a jerk or whatever. So it's kind of justified. You got to accept with your whole heart. It's not justified. You made a mistake. That's okay. We have a God who forgives sins. But step one, you got to repent. You got to go on your knees before Jesus and say, Jesus, I made a mistake. I committed adultery. I went with someone who wasn't my husband or my spouse, or maybe you didn't fully commit adultery. Maybe you were planning to, I don't know, some degree of it, right? Whatever it was, you got to repent, which is just to see in the clear light of day that it was wrong, that you shouldn't have done it. Repent and say, Lord, I'm, I, I was in the wrong for seeking these things from someone other than my husband or wife. That's the first thing to do. You know, well, first thing to do is get it out of your mind that it's going to work seeking that avenue because believe me, it won't. <laughs> Once you see that, repent for having made the mistake of seeking those things from someone other than your spouse. Okay. Once that's done, pray to the Lord in Jesus' name that he will help you and your husband slash wife to fix and restore your marriage. Tell the Lord that this is your choice. You want your marriage to be fixed. And all the things that you saw from the adulterer or from the new potential spouse, you want to get them from your husband or wife. All the things that you were seeking from the adulterer, love, friendship, intimacy, etc., check this out. Start giving them to your husband or your wife. Matthew 7, 12. All things whatsoever that you would have men do to you, do you also unto them. The things that you're not getting from your husband or your wife, after you've repented, you've prayed to the Lord to help you fix your marriage, start doing them preemptively to your husband or your wife. So in Christian in Christianity, we're called to do this preemptively. The typical human way of thinking is like, if someone's nice to me, then I'll be nice to them. If somebody gives me what I want, I'll give them what they want. But we are called as Christians to not be like that. We are called to follow the Sermon on the Mount and to bless them that curse us, to pray for them that despitefully use us, right? To do good to them that do evil to us, to never return evil with evil, but return evil with good. So all the things that you're not getting from your husband or your wife, make more of an effort to give it to them. Now, I know that might sound confusing, but why? But they're the ones who's not giving it to me. Take the lead and start giving more of it to them. Just try. Just give a little. Can you give your husband or your wife a mustard seed of of love, of companionship? Just start with a mustard seed. Express it in your actions, even if you don't feel like doing it. Just try. Give your two mites, like the widow who gives her two little coins to the church. Give your husband or your wife two mites, even if they're being a jerk, even if they committed adultery on you, and then you caught them in it and they repented. Just give them two mites of what you want them to give to you. Love, intimacy, companionship, and trust. Start acting towards your husband or your wife the way that you would want them to act towards you. Just start with the mustard seed. All right. Now I got some rhetorical questions for you because I heard from a lot of Brethren, something along the lines of like, well, you know, my wife or my husband, either they committed adulter- adultery on me a few years ago, or they did this to me, or they said these really cruel things, or they just refused to be intimate with me. And they, brethren have said to me, I feel like I can never forgive them for it. I feel like I'll never love them again. I feel like I can never let it go. And that's why I'm now thinking of divorcing them or cheating on them, committing adultery, right? So what I want to say now are some rhetorical questions. So Do you believe the following? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has the power to forgive all of your sins and deliver you from an eternity in hell? Does he have the power to do that? Okay. Do you believe that Jesus spoke the entire universe into existence just with the power of his word? Do you believe that? Okay. When all the nations in the world rise against Israel, does Jesus have the power to defend and deliver Israel? from the combined military might of the entire world and the Antichrist system? Does he have that power? And finally, at the Battle of Armageddon, does Jesus have the power to wipe out the entire assembled forces of the Antichrist with a single breath? Does he? Answer to all those questions is yes. Yes, he does. And if you don't believe me on that, well, there's other parts in the Bible we can get to where they all say that that's what's going to happen. So if the answer to all those questions is yes, then why would you doubt that Jesus has the power to restore, to deliver, to sanctify, to mend, to cleanse, to strengthen, and ennoble your marriage with your husband or your wife. Our God is a Savior. 
He is a deliverer. He is a restorer. He is a fixer of things that seem beyond human power. For him, nothing is impossible. He can and will restore your marriage to a point where it fulfills your soul in every way, to a degree you have never experienced before, to a level of joy that you cannot presently even imagine. But you will experience it if you choose for him to do that and you go along with it and do your part. He knows your infirmities and your capabilities. He will never ask of you anything you are not capable of giving. To him who has, more will be given. Jesus has complete dominion over your heart and your husband or your wife's heart. He can remove the negative thoughts, the grudges, the anger, the lack of love, all the negative emotions. He can remove all that, and and the positive emotions, he can increase those. But you must be willing to go along with the process. Romans 5.20, but where sin abounded, grace did abound much more. So maybe your husband or your wife did some terrible things. Maybe they committed adultery and they repented over it. They feel bad. Maybe that they don't go to church. Maybe they've said a lot of mean things to you. Maybe they haven't supported you. Maybe they have not done their due benevolence to you. Well, where sin abounded, grace will abound much more. But it's up to you to choose this option for God to help you with his grace because God will not force it upon you, okay? The eye of tulip is false. Tulip's this thing the Calvinists believe. The eye is irresistible grace, meaning that God just forces his grace on people and they can't resist it. It's easy to disprove with just one scripture to name many, Matthew 23, 37. That's where Jesus says something like, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who spill the blood of the prophets, how many times would I have gathered you and your children together like a mother hen, but you were not willing. So this shows that like grace can be resisted. Jesus is saying to Jerusalem, I would have fixed things here a long time ago. I would have gathered you all, but you weren't willing. So you have to be willing. Okay. So the brethren I spoke to, from what I could tell, it sounds like they all had legitimate grievances against their partner. Their partner wasn't fulfilling stuff. In some cases, their partner had committed adultery on them. Um, They had done things that were wrong. But I now call our attention to Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. As I was preparing this sermon, I watched other sermons on divorce, and I saw a good sermon by John Barnett, one of my favorite pastors, And he had a great line in it. He said, God forgives, but oftentimes Christians don't. Um, I call your attention to Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So like I said, I talked to brothers and sisters in Christ who had had legit sins committed against him. In some cases, even the husband or wife had had committed adultery on him. Um, but they were repentant about it, right? They were the, the ones who had committed the adultery. It's like they called him. They felt bad. They were sorry. They said, please don't leave me, right? Look at this verse. If you forgive them their trespasses and you pray to the Lord and say, Lord, help fix my marriage. I want to stay with him. Then God will forgive your own trespasses. But if you don't, right, because what are we supposed to do? If a man be overtaken in a fault, like if your husband or wife committed a fault, guess what? They're human. They did something wrong. They committed adultery. Now realize there's a big difference between it's like they did it, they're repentant, they know it was wrong versus they did it and they're like proud of it and they're doing it in your face and you try to get them to see that it's wrong and they just keep doing it and it goes on for six months and there's just, you know, okay, that's different. That's like utter unrepentant fornication and that is the one clause when you can leave them but not if they like did it once and they're sorry about it and they say uh, you know please don't leave me i want to make it work there's a big difference in god's eyes between like sin that's repented of versus sin that there's no repentance whatsoever and in each case that i talked to it uh it was a scenario where the spouse who was thinking of leaving their husband or wife the husband or wife had, in some cases I talked to, had committed adultery against him, but in each case, there was some repentance. The husband or wife was like, I shouldn't have done it. I'm sorry. 
and and it seemed like they either had stopped the adultery or you know the partners sometimes told me they weren't sure but in each case it seemed like the husband and wife was repentant in those cases i strongly 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 feel that what god wants is for you to forgive them because he forgives us and that's what he commands us to do here that if a man be overtaken in a fault ye which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted because just like they fell into the fault of adultery, you could too. So the best thing for you to do is to forgive them, right? How many times might I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Seven? Nah, 70 times seven, 490 times. If people commit a sin, even a sin of fornication or adultery, but they're repentant, they know that it's wrong, they see that it's wrong, they're sorry about it, then we are to forgive them. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Um because I, I heard this a lot in cases where actual adultery had occurred, but also just in cases where there were other sins that people's partners had done to them. And I heard this line a lot from both men and women, people saying something to me like, I can just never forgive my partner because of what they did in the past or their attitude or the fact that, that they don't go to church or, or that they seem more interested in their hobbies than they are in me. They just, people were telling me like, I just feel like I can never let it go. And what I'm saying is you may feel like that, but pray to God to change your heart. Pray to God. Use that mustard seed. Just try to forgive him a little. Pray to God. He can work on your heart and your husband or your wife's heart. Um, he can do what I call a reverse Romans 1. What we see in Romans 1 is, you know, why is it that some people are zoophiliacs, meaning they have sex with animals? Other people are homosexuals. Well, they're not homosexuals, but they have homosexual desires. Romans 1 clearly explains that these are individuals who they defied God. They rejected God. They rejected his standard of truth and goodness. And so God gave their hearts over to evil, ungodly desires. And that's why we see people who are pedophiles, who are having sex with animals, who are having homosexuality or multi-orgy groups or all the things that the Bible defines as sexual immorality. So what God's basically saying is that didn't just happen randomly. These people rejected God. They rejected godly desires. They rejected the right path. And so God says, okay, I'll give you over to your evil desires so that the whole world can see your shame and see how dysfunctional it is to have a world where people are having multiple orgies with animals or homosexual this or pedophiles, all the stuff that God says you shouldn't do. God says, one man, one woman together for life no adultery. That's how it goes. But Romans 1 is where you defy God. So God lets God says, ah, you, you don't want to follow my, my uh, ordinances. Okay. I'll let your heart be given over to all these twisted desires that'll never fulfill you so that you can disgrace one another by almost, I'll make you a teaching example of the whole world to see just why it is I command these ordinances. So the whole world can see your shame as you become a little Sodom and Gomorrah. But what I want to say to you here today is God can do the reverse of that. He can reverse Romans 1 you, meaning that if you come to God and you say, God, I want to follow your ordinances. I accept you. I accept what you have said is right and wrong. I want to want what you want me to want. He can reverse Romans 1 you, meaning he can take out of your heart. Let's say that you're someone that you committed adultery on your spouse. You know, you can go before God and be like, I'm sorry, I should have, I should have desired my husband or wife. I'm sorry I did that. And he can take out of your heart the desire you have for the adulterer or for other men and women and point it back towards your spouse. And he can do the same with your spouse's heart and point them back towards you. He has dominion over your heart and your thoughts and your mind. Just like he can keep you breathing or he can give you a heart attack and drop you, he can put desires on your heart. He can take them off. And if you pray to him and you do the opposite of what they did in Romans 1, but you say, God, help me get rid of my ungodly desires. Help me only desire my husband or wife. Renew my love for them. Renew my attraction towards them. He can do it, but he's not going to force it on you. Romans 1 shows that he gives us all a choice. He's not going to force his grace down your throat. But if you ask him for it, he will give it to you. So... In a situation where your husband or your wife did something wrong, whether they cheated on you or they said abusive words or they, they just did something that was really wrong, maybe the husband stopped paying the bills, maybe the wife just refused to have intimacy with the husband, things that are all definitely serious sins. I believe that in this situation, you forgiving your husband or your wife for their sin of adultery or whatever it was is crucial. And I think God's watching your heart to see if you will do this, right? 
to see if you'll follow Matthew 6, 14 and 15, that if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive yours. Because when we get focused on the sins of another, no matter how genuine those sins are, we tend to forget our own sins. We tend to justify our own sins. And Satan has a little script, he says in our ears, like, oh, well, someone sinned against you. Well, therefore, you're just going to have to sin back. Oh, they cheated on you? Well, well, you got a cheat pass. And God does not see it that way. That's not what he commands us to do. He commands us to forgive them. And that if they're overtaken in a fault, that we try to restore them in a spirit of meekness. And we consider ourselves because we could easily fall into the same fault that they fell into. And that's how we fulfill the law of Christ. So if your husband or wife did something to you, whether it was adultery or something else, just try to forgive them. Ask God for help. Say, God, help me forgive them and love them again. He will help. He will answer that prayer. Okay. So uh, furthermore, I just want to express, express something here just to finally tell you the seriousness of the situation. I want to mention a particular case that I had where I talked to one of the brethren in Christ and they basically were saying that they were considering getting a divorce because their spouse just wasn't fulfilling them. And they gave me a list of stuff that the spouse did. It sounded all terrible. I was like, yeah, I understand why you're not fulfilled. It sounds like a terrible situation. And they were telling me like, you know, I think I might just get a divorce. I think maybe this was just the wrong person for me. I'm thinking I could just get a divorce and I'm just going to get a new spouse. And, uh, and so I went before the Lord and prayed about it. Oh man, the Lord responded right away. The Lord was very clear with me. I mean, he, he always talks to me, but like sometimes it's more like I got to search it out more. But in this case, I basically said, Lord, what should I tell this person? Because this person came to me and said, yo, Evan, I'm thinking of getting a divorce. My spouse is just doing all this bad stuff and I'm just unhappy and I've been trying for years and it's not getting better. I think I might just divorce him and go look for a new spouse. And so I said, all right, let me, let me pray about this. So I prayed. I said, Lord, what, what should I, what should I tell this brother? And what should I tell him? Dude, the Lord came through clear as day. And right away, he pointed out these scriptures, right? That we have here. And the Lord told me, and he basically said, tell them this. He said, tell them that they have a choice that if they stay with their partner and they don't get divorced, that I can fix their marriage that I can restore it. I can restore their heart. I can restore their spouse's heart and I can bring their marriage to a new level of peace and joy that they've never even experienced. That if they choose to stay and work through it and start treating their spouse the way they want their spouse to treat them, that I, the Lord, can use my power and will restore their marriage and will that, that all the needs that they're considering getting fulfilled by some other potential spouse, I can, I can make their current spouse fulfill those needs and work on their heart and their spouse's heart. I can and I will do that. But the Lord also said very clearly, that if they get a divorce, if they choose to take that path, the Lord told me, I will punish them for the rest of their life. And he had me write it down in very specific words. And then he even told me, tell them, thus saith the Lord. Now, this is very notable for me because you guys know, I'm basically talking to the Lord's ear off all day. If talking to the Lord too much is a sin, then I, I should be like getting my hair set on fire right now because I talk to the Lord all day. Lord, is it this? Lord, what about this? Like I'm Mr. Chatterbox with the Lord. And the Lord's always guiding me and he's, he's showing me scriptures, insights suddenly emerge. I'm like, oh, I think that was you, Lord. And right. But most of the time, the way it works with the Lord is that like, I'll be praying about something. I'll be thinking about something. He'll guide me to stuff. I'll be like, is the sermon ready, Lord? He's like, nah, keep working, Evan. Like sometimes he tells me like, I'll delete that part. Like I work on it. I get to a point where, where I'm like, okay, Lord, are we ready to give the sermon? He's like, okay, go. I'm not saying the sermon's perfect. I'm just saying I get to a point where I'm like, okay, Lord, this is the best I can do to understand it. Is it good enough? And then you usually reach a point where he's like, okay, Evan, go. You have it. You know, I'm not saying it's perfect, but he's like, okay, good enough, Evan, go give your sermon. But then if I ask the Lord, I'm like, Lord, should I say that you told me this? Because certain insights, certain things, the Lord will tell me. And I'll be like, wow. And then I'm like, Lord, should I say you told me that? Now, most time he says, no. He says, just tell people. He says, just present it to him. And he says, let them decide with my word and the, the, my Holy Spirit that dwells with them if you're right or not. Like, just tell them, hey, I'm Evan. And this is what I believe from studying the Bible. He says, just present it before him and they can figure it out. And I think he then watches the viewer's hearts and, and sees it sees if they agree or not. And I'm sure certain things I say are probably off. And so he's kind of checking, but that's pretty much what he always does. He says, just, just say it's your opinion, just put it forward, just give it to them and then let them decide through looking at my word, if you're right or not. That's what he does almost all the time. But once in a while, he will actually tell me, no, he'll say, and this is, this has always been in a case where I'm talking to someone personally one-on-one -on -one, 
where he'll say, tell them this and tell them thus saith the Lord. Now, I know a lot of people like don't believe that. They don't think that God does that anymore. That's fine. You don't have to believe that. But like in certain individual cases where I was talking to people, the Lord very strongly told me like, tell them this. And he then added and said, and tell them that it's not just your opinion, that it's not just your idea. Tell them I, the Lord, am telling them this. Now, of course, they're free to believe it or not, but he told me to say that. So he doesn't usually do that. And when he does that, I can tell that it's like a serious situation, that he wants them to know that this isn't just like Evan's idea, that this is like, you know, something that he wants. Like, for all, I'll give another example. Like the other day, he asked me to ask a certain person to engage in a charitable act. And he told me to tell that person, like, the Lord is commanding this. <laughs> it's almost like he didn't want me to get credit for it. Because it's like, I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. <laughs> and I can see, and he kind of showed me that, like, this is coming from Jesus's generosity, not from mine. So when I was speaking to the person, I told them, like, you should engage in this act of generosity. And it's not like me saying this out of my own generosity. It's the Lord is, is saying this, you know. But anyway, the reason I mentioned that was that in this case, where I was speaking to this particular brethren who's like, yeah, I'm thinking of getting divorced. The Lord was super clear with me. And he basically said, tell them these things. And he even had me write it down. I'm not going to read the actual words. You know, that's for them. But I'm going to tell you the essence of it. He basically said, I, the Lord, will restore your marriage. If you choose right now to stay in the marriage, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to bring it to a better level than ever. But you have to choose. But if you get divorced, you will be punished for this for the rest of your life. It's a serious thing. And so he had... He had me write all that down. I was like, okay, Lord, I'm supposed to add, thus saith the Lord to that statement. To this one, he's like, no, not that one, Evan. That one's your own opinion. So I'm like, okay. So I was like working with him. Like I just about had it finished. I'm like, okay, Lord. So I'm going to tell him this. I'm going to tell him this. I'm going to say that you say that you will restore their marriage, that you say that, you know, they're going to get punished if they do get a divorce for the rest of their life. And so I had the whole thing ready and I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm about to like call them and like deliver the message. Like, are we all set? And, and he's like, the Lord is like, no, nope, you're missing a single word. And I was like, where, where? So I work with him. We go through our communication. I'm like, where am I missing a single word? You know what word he had me add to it? Under the sentence I had written that if you do choose to get divorced here, the Lord will punish you for the rest of your life. You know what word he had me add to that? Severely. <laughs> he wanted it to read, the Lord will punish you severely for the rest of your life if you choose to divorce your partner right now. So I added that word and I, I brought it to the brethren and, you know, let's pray let, that they make the right choice. And it, it caused me to recall the scripture where the Lord says, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you two choices, good and evil, life or death. And I felt very strongly that was what the Lord was saying. And I didn't get a feeling from the Lord during this interaction of anger. It's like it, he wasn't like angry at this person they were considering divorce. He just wanted it really clear that they had an option. And that if they did the right thing and they stayed with their partner, that that he was going to restore it, that he wanted to, that he was like eager to bless them. Like it wasn't a feeling of like rebuke towards them. It was like he wanted me to make it really clear, like they've got two options, but they're very divergent options. If they choose to stay with their partner, the Lord is going to restore it and bless their marriage and it's going to be incredible. But if they choose to get divorced and in doing so basically break all of these scriptures that say that the Lord is going to severely punish them for the rest of their life. And I have to say, I have spoken to multiple brethren who are in that position who got divorced like X amount of years ago and they're suffering. And like, that's why I say to you that if you think you're going to get divorced and just get a better husband or wife, like based on my experience talking to brethren, it's not going to happen. You're basically, the examples that I saw was that the people that got divorced would then get a new spouse who would then like abuse them even worse than their first spouse, would cheat on them, would do all this terrible stuff. And it, they would end up in a worse situation or they just ended up single and just, just swore off men and women altogether, but still wanted one, but just felt sad and single. And I'm telling you, I didn't hear a single story about someone who was like, yeah, I had a believer brother, uh, excuse me, a believer spouse. Then I just left them and then life got better. It's like in every case, it got worse. And in the cases I spoke to, it's like it almost seemed to be kind of like a permanent condition. But I guess I would like to give a word of hope here, which is that if you did, if you are a believer listening to this and you did divorce your spouse and you realize that it's wrong, you know, saving unless it was the case, like I said, that your spouse was just fornicating right and left, had no repentance. Dude, because I'm just telling you what I would do. If I was married and my wife started fornicating left to right, I wouldn't even divorce her right away. I'd give it like six months. 
I'd pray to the Lord every day. I'd try to talk to her. I'd give it six months of her doing it in my face before finally I would ask the Lord, Lord, have we reached the point when I should just leave? And if he commanded me to, then I would leave. But like what I can see is he hates divorce. He wants to restore the marriage. He can. And even if one partner isn't willing, if, if, the, if the one partner is and they're like forgiving and loving, that has immense power to change hearts. I've seen in my own life how the Lord has changed the hearts of my parents. You know, when I first got reborn and got into Jesus, let's just put it this way. My parents were not exactly over the moon about it. They're hardcore atheists and they were not happy to see their son become a super Christian, right? Like they were not psyched about it. But I can see how over time, it's like winning them over. They're starting to see, you know, my father even told me the other day, he said, Evan, you know, I don't share any of your beliefs about Jesus, but he said, Evan, I can see how they've given you a newfound direction and energy that I've never seen in you before. You know, and my father's never told me that before. And so I can see how even with my parents in their pure unbelief, how my actions and my faith in Jesus, which is really just the Holy Spirit working on me, is starting to change and warm their hearts, which is amazing. And if the Lord can do that, even with unbelievers, imagine how he can do it with your husband or wife. Even if your husband and wife has drifted from the Lord and they don't go to church, they don't read the Bible, you know, the Lord can start working on them through you if you're willing to forgive them and to start doing unto them the things that you're lacking from them. It's preemptive. It's like, it's not, we think of love and goodness as like, well, if I feel like loving them, then I will. But, but guys, love's an action. It's something you do. You can do it even when you don't feel like it. And when you do that, I see that the Lord really appreciates that. It's like, you know what? I feel like cussing this person out, but you know what? I'm just going to say, God bless you. Like love is an action. It's something we do. And as we do unto others, like I feel a big part of how the Lord treats us is how he sees we treat other people. He will treat us in many ways the way that we treat others. If we are forgiving towards others, he'll be very forgiving to us. If we're very gentle to others for their mistakes, he'll be gentle to us for ours. But if we're harsh and unforgiving and bitter, we can't be shocked if our spouse is then that back towards us. But if we're willing to fulfill the law of Christ and restore them, and if our partner cheated on us or did something wrong, but they're sorry to repent, well, we just think, you know, our God forgives them, so we should be like our God and forgive them to the best of our ability. So don't doubt the Lord's power to take these wicked things out of your heart, this unforgiveness, this bitterness, this anger. You know, you're human, you feel it, but don't doubt the Lord's power to change your heart from within with his Holy Spirit. But you got to go along with it. You got to say, Lord, I want my marriage to be restored. Lord, I want to be fulfilled emotionally and sexually and intimately and friendship wise, but I want it from my husband or my wife. When he sees you make that decision, and if, and if it's the case that, that you've committed adultery, that you just repent, just God, forgive me. I made a mistake. He will forgive you. When, if we confess our faults, right? What is it? First, one John one nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He can do that. But you've got to fully repent. you got to get rid of the Satan excuse that like, well, they sinned against me, so I had a right to sin against them. God doesn't work like that. Like other people's sins never give us a right to commit sins. We're always judged for our own sins, not for sins of others. And so I hope this sermon has been helpful. And what I can see is that our society, our culture is Satan is specifically targeting women with this. And Satan is giving women this impression that like marriage is supposed to just be this thing where it's like the job where you just get paid, but you don't have to work, where it's just kind of like you just get all these benefits and this this handsome guy and he's just giving you everything. And if, if at any point it drops below like what, what you would like, well, then you just get rid of him and you'll get another guy. And Satan makes it seem to women as if there's just this infinite supply of just better and better men. And as if you can just take one, it will. Almost like you buy a car and you're driving it and then it kind of breaks down. And you're like, ah. I'll just buy a new car. I'll just get a new Audi A7. Satan's really lying, and I see him specifically lying to women, making it seem like you can always just get a new husband. Like, oh, your current husband's gotten a bit older, is doing some sin or whatever. Ah, just dump him and pick up a new one. But what you got to realize is the Lord doesn't reward that behavior. He, do he just doesn't. You're under God's judgment. You're, like, you need God to get a partner. You can't just get one. doesn't matter how many matches you have on Tinder. doesn't matter how many options it seems you have. The only options you really have as a believer are the options that God gives you. And he never wants to punish you. He never wants to bring the hammer down, but he will if he has to. And when it comes to marriage and divorce, that's an area where that's like very near and dear to God's heart. Like I said, like if God forbid you got drunk and beat someone up over a football game, 
it's like, okay, well, that's wrong. But like, but you want to see a really nasty thing? Get divorced. Then you'll see. Because if you think about it, it makes sense. Because when you get divorced and you destroy a family, if you have children, man, that passes your pain onto the children for their whole lives. And it sets up a pattern where those children, your children might go and then get divorced because they think it's normal because you're teaching them a lesson that mommy and daddy, when they went through a rough patch, daddy left mommy or mommy left daddy. And that teaches them that then when they're married, that they can just do that. And it just proliferates this twisted system. And if you could see it from God's eye view, that decision of divorce spreads so much pain onto the person that gets left onto the children, onto you, because guess what? It's not going to work out like your fantasy. You're not going to meet Mr. Even Better because God does not reward divorce like he really doesn't. It's, it's, it's like the destruction of a family that God has put together and blessed you with, and it passes the pain onto your children, and you never hear children go, oh yeah, you know, life was terrible until mommy and daddy got divorced when I was a teenager, and then it was great having shared custody. It's like, no, there's a reason. Like children who grow up in divorce homes it hurts them. It passes pain onto them. God wants the home to be one man, one woman, sticking together through thick and thin. There's going to be moments when your marriage is really hard. There's going to be seasons of trial. But if you come to God and you ask him to help and you do everything you can to give your spouse the things that you want to get from them, it's amazing the power that God has to restore. Our God is a restorer. He can fix stuff no one can. You're saying, oh, I don't think my spouse will ever act the way I want. Well, you know who can make him act that way is God. If God wants to, if he wants to flex that power, he has dominion over their hearts. He has dominion over your hearts. You have stuff in your heart. You think you can never forgive someone? Ask Jesus help. He can help take that away. I've seen him do it in my own life in many different areas. And I'm telling you, the Lord wants your marriage to be fixed. The husband of your youth, the wife of your youth, your first and only lawful husband. Unless your husband died, that's a different situation. Or your wife died, right? Or if they're an unbeliever, and they left you, or if you got divorced before you were reborn. In those cases, it's different. But if you're a believer and you know Jesus and you've been saved, you really, this is only the most narrow situation that God will permit divorce, which is like utter unrepentant fornication, giving them time. They have no remorse. They just keep doing it in your face. So you let time pass. At that point, I believe God will tell you with the Holy Spirit, now is the time to go. But that's really not something he ever likes. It brings God great sorrow. And that's why we see that Jesus says, Moses, because of your hardness of hearts, because you Jewish men left those women of your youth, your original wives, and went whoring after these evil demonic women of foreign gods. Because of that, I allowed you to give your wives rich of divorcement because of your hardness of hearts. Not because it was part of God's plan. That was never how it was supposed to be. But because you guys did this evil thing in the sight of the Lord, I basically allowed the bond to be cut for the sake of your poor wives that you would like abandoned. And I realize it applies both ways. If, if this had been a bunch of women abandoning the husbands of their use, the same thing applies. Like, why are you covering my altar with tears? Why are you saying, oh, you want to accept your offerings? God's like, because you dealt treacherously and you did an abomination in my sight, which is divorce. And as God showed me, like people that get divorced, if you just choose that divorce, man, like, God doesn't like that. Now, if your partner like divorces you and you have no choice about it and you fight and you try to keep the marriage together and your partner just shoves the divorce down your throat and you can't accept it, don't worry. Like in that case, God knows who's at fault. He can see both people's hearts. And if you're like trying to hold on to your marriage with everything you can and your wife or husband just leaves you in the course, just enforce it. Don't worry. God's not going to bring the hammer down on you because he sees that you didn't want it, that you were trying to fulfill your vows, that you fought tooth and nail. So my advice is, don't go along with divorce. Fight it. If both partners equally agree to divorce, I think the hammer is going to drop on both of them because God hates divorce. He hates it. It's like a severe spiritual felony and he will punish people for the rest of their lives for it. And you're not going to find the man or woman of your dreams through adultery or through getting a new spouse. Realize that the two are essentially uh, synonymous with God. Like if you just divorce your husband or wife and then like get a new person, as the scriptures say, he considers that adultery. So like, adultery will not work. Don't listen to Satan. I see these stupid advice columns every day in mainstream media like, oh, my boyfriend did this. He left the toilet seat down too many times or, or something. Like, I'm going to get a new boyfriend. And the advice columns are like, yeah, you ditch him, girl. That's a red flag. You get a new uh, partner. And it's like, it's never going to work. It's not going to work. It's not, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. You're going to get an even worse partner or you're going to get no partner at all. And like the way to happiness is to restore your original marriage 
with the power of God who will help, but you have to accept his grace. You have to choose it. And if you do, he can work miracles. He can turn things in your heart. You can find yourself with a newfound desire for the husband or your wife or your youth. You will find they have a newfound desire for you. Just give God a little time to work and tell him that you choose this, that you don't want divorce. If you did commit fornication or adultery, ask him to forgive you. Say, I made a mistake. Help me fix my marriage. If your partner fornicated or adulterated on you, forgive them. And with the spirit of meekness, restore them and say, you know what? I forgive you. Let's work on our marriage. Let's do this together. The Lord will be very happy to see you doing that. Fulfilling the law of Christ. He's going to bless you. He will bless your marriage. Your broken marriage is not working. Come to him and tell him you want it to be fixed and he will bless it. But if you choose the option of divorce, thinking that you're just going to switch partners and get a better one, I'm telling you, it's not going to work. It's it, It'd be like if a Christian was like, yeah, I've been following Jesus and life is really hard. I think I'm going to switch to worshiping a Hindu God. I'd be like, don't do it, dude. Don't do it. It's going to get worse. It's going to ruin your life. You know, Jesus, and you're thinking of switching to Allah or something. Don't do it for the love of God. Don't do it. God's going to heavily judge you for it. It's going to make stuff worse. However bad you think it is, it's going to get worse, you know? And that's what I would say about divorce. It's a super serious thing. God considers it treachery. I know you may be hurting. I know your partner is not giving you what you want. God's hurting too. He's a restorer. He wants to fix your marriage. He will fix your marriage. He can fix your marriage. He's the Alpha and Omega. Not an atom can vibrate without his consent. Not a sparrow can drop from the sky. He can do everything, but he's looking at your heart right now. And he's saying, ball in your court. What do you choose? Do you choose divorce and adultery and realize that they're basically the same thing to him? which is that I'm now, I made a vow for life to one person, but now I'm thinking of switching to another person. Do you choose that? Or do you choose, no, I'm going to restore this. With God's power, I'm going to reunite it. And if you choose that restoration, I believe God will not just restore your marriage to what it was before. He'll make it even better than it was before. He'll raise it up because you're doing the right thing. You're forgiving your partner their trespasses and you're asking God to change their heart. And even if only one partner is active in this process, God will see that and he will honor the whole marriage and bless it and just raise it up. And it's incredible. But if you choose divorce, realize that like, if you think your life is bad now with your current partner, like it can get a whole lot worse. But like I said, a final word of hope. If you are in a position where you divorced your, uh, your spouse and you realize it was wrong and you've repented, well, the option God gives you are two. You can either get reconciled to him, or if that's not possible, because maybe they moved on and got remarried or something. Well, then you're going to have to accept a life of singleness. But that's okay. Whatever position you're in in life, whatever sins you made, you can bear it. Your, your punishment's never going to be too much for you to bear. If you realize, you know, I divorced my partner, I shouldn't have done it. Now I can't find a new partner. I would say become a maiden of the Lord, or a, I don't know what the equivalent term would be for a man of the Lord. Be like Paul except that your gift now is singleness and the Lord will never put you in a position where you have no options. He just wants you to see your mistakes, repent of them. And hopefully you don't get that divorce. But if you did and you can see the damage that it's done to your life, just repent for it before the Lord and say, Lord, now that I'm in this position of singleness, well, how can I serve you from this position? And he will show you and he will restore you and you accept his justice and he can make you happy in any position. He can even make you happy in a position of just being single. Uh, that's where I am right now. I'm single. I'm happy. I'm waiting for the Lord to send me my godly wife if that that's his will. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what his will is for me. And I'm happy whatever he does. I got a feeling he is going to send me a godly wife at some point because I'd be really I'm really psyched to have like a godly marriage. But one thing I'm telling you, man, I am not going to divorce her. <laughs> Worst case scenario, man, I am just going to keep pleading with God, pleading with her because I see from the last couple weeks of studying this, God hates divorce. And just as he hates divorce, he loves those who stick it out. He loves it when you fight for your marriage. He loves it when you just try to forgive. As much as he hates divorce, he loves it when you fight to restore it, when you fight to bring it back. It's like a brother in Christ who sins. Forgive him. Fight to bring him back into the fold. Fight for his soul. Someone doesn't receive testimony about Jesus. Fight for their souls. He loves that. That's what he does. He's a savior. He's a fighter. He's got patience. He's long-suffering. May we embody Christ, may Christ live in us in the Holy Spirit, and may we express it with our words, our actions, and may the meditations of our heart be acceptable in his sight, the great one, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What God has joined together, let no man cut apart. So 
That's my sermon for all those facing this tough issue that many are in. Stay with your partner and pray to God and get ready to be blown away by his grace because he can fix it. He will fix it. He just wants to see you go along with it. And he's searching your heart every moment to see if you're willing to forgive, if you're willing to repent of your own sins. And if you want that marriage to be restored, you want it to go back. Oh man, he the wind is going to be at your back. But as long as you're thinking, ah, I think I might commit adultery, get divorced, the wind is, is going to be in your face. And you're just wondering why you're miserable and you're filling the Lord's altar with your tears and you don't get it. And it's like, because the Lord's trying to strongly warn you, wrong direction, <laughs> wrong direction. It's not going to make you happier. It's not going to work. Satan's going to say, oh, that's what you should do. Just have an affair. Have a six person animal, human child, thruples, zuppel, whatever. Oh, it's the new thing. Have you heard of it? It's called super sexual immorality with a new marketing spin that makes it sound great. It's like, nah, that's going to lead you to utter human misery, shame, defeat, disgrace, and suffering. You want to be happy? Follow the rules of the Holy Scripture of our Lord. Embody his statutes. Live them out. You won't do so perfectly, but just try your best you can. And the Lord's going to bless you. And he's going to fill your heart with a happiness and a peace that you've never known. And if your heart doesn't have that happiness and peace, then search your heart and see if there's anything that may not be something the Lord would like. And pray to him to that those demons who are whispering to you, just get a divorce. Just cheat on your partner. Just... Just do sexual immorality. You know, pray to the Lord to help drive those demons away. And when those thoughts arise, say no to them and listen to the Holy Spirit because he's always talking to you. He always is. If you're reborn, he's in you. He's in you. You have the Holy Spirit. Just listen. You'll know him by his peace, that when he speaks, he's so peaceful, so joyous. He's so confident. He's so patient. You know, you'll learn the Holy Spirit because he's just, it's, it's the fruits of the Spirit, man. Joy, peace, love, long suffering. You can feel him. He's always there. He loves it when you seek him. He's like your best invisible friend who's always right there. And you just listen to Mr. Holy Spirit, as I call him, and he will not guide you wrong. And his grace is sufficient for all of us. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for the sermon for now. I, I hope I've shed some light on this most crucial of decisions. But seriously, don't get a divorce. It's going to make your life way worse. It's going to make your children's lives worse. It's going to make your partner's life worse. Hang in there and have some faith that the same God who can wipe out all the forces of the Antichrist with a single breath, yes, he can also restore your marriage. Yes, he wants to. And yes, he will, because he is all powerful, all knowing, all wise, alpha and omega. And anyone who tries to move against him is going to be utterly annihilated with eternal conscious torment and hell for all eternity if they don't accept him. That's how powerful our God is. So cheers to our God, the Savior. And with that, I say, may the Lord Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you. And like I said, if you want to contact me, donate to the ministry, uh, give me a call on the phone, join our Inner Sanctum group. I'll put all that uh, information into the description. And thank you all for all your prayers, for your donations, for your questions, for your emails, for everything everyone's done to support the ministry. I appreciate it so much. This ministry is my pride and joy. It's, it's my calling on the earth. It's the thing God's given me to do, and I love it so much. And I say thank you, God, and bless you, God the Father. Bless you, God the Son, Christ Jesus, and bless you, Holy Spirit. And bless all of you for watching my sermon. And I'll be back soon with many more sermons. The next one is going to be about how part of the difficulty of the Christian life is actually accepting grace. We think it's all about like resisting sin, but a big part of it is that God can actually make your life much better than you can almost even handle if you're willing for him to. A lot of times we accept the grace because it just boggles our mind. It's like, like he's offering us this incredible option, but it's like almost hard for us to even accept that life can be that good, but it can be, and it will be if you accept his grace because grace is a strange thing, man. It's like a quality of God. It's just getting what we don't deserve. It's just, we don't deserve it, but we're given it anyway. It's really a bizarre quality that as far as I can tell, only God truly has it. Like humans aren't like that. We're nice to people that are nice to us. We give people stuff that we think they deserve. I'll do this work. You'll give me that money. But God's not like that. He just gives more and more grace. Like assuming that we do our little part and like try to follow his word and stuff. But even then he gives us way more than we deserve. If we're willing to accept it, it's incredible, man. But anyway, that that's the subject of a future sermon. How one of the hardest things about the Christian life is not necessarily even like resisting sin. It's actually accepting the grace because it just seems too good. It's just like, but why? But I don't deserve this. And God's like, you don't. 
but I'll give it to you. <laughs> and it's like amazing. Grace, grace is strange, man. It's an alien quality because only God has it. Only he is truly graceful. It's his nature. And that's why it blows our minds as humans. Because even the best among us, we should try to be graceful. We should try to mimic it. But it's not really our nature, but it's God's nature. And it's amazing. Okay, guys, with that said, we'll, we'll save that for the next sermon. Thank you guys for watching this one. Thanks so much for your support of the ministry. And may the peace, joy, and comfort of our Lord Christ Jesus be with each and every one of you through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you all to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ and God the Father forever and ever. Amen.